So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think this debate will be about ecology and uh, about resources. And I think it's uh, the group of people that are with us today uh, are really interesting. So just uh, to introduce Claire Trone, that uh, she's an artist uh, from um, England. So she will present um, her uh, work. Alison Tickle, uh, she's the founder of uh, Jolie Bicycles. So this is a non-profit company that helping the music industry to reduce the environmental impact. And then we have uh, Timothy Lecain, that is professor, is a uh, historian and is professor at the Montana State University. And um, the idea of this discussion is uh, to talk about ecology and maybe the relation between human and non-human. And I think what is really interesting today is that, you know, we, because of the climate uh, change that is uh, in a certain way transforming our condition of living as human, and also the virus that is also a new actor uh, inside the field of, um, of the world. So we are no more, you know, like the 70 last year where we were like the king of the world, you know, the human was like uh, dominating the world. And, um, and so I think today, because of the climate change, because of the virus, we understand that the non-human are also there. And I think what is interesting in our debate uh, is to understand that maybe the relation is not only from human to non-human, you know, this is something that is really common today in the French philosophy, for example, everybody are talking about, okay, to think like a tree, to think like an ice, uh, to think like an animal, but nobody is talking about, oh, and the animal is thinking about the human. And uh, I think this discussion we, is um, really interesting in this uh, relationship between human and non-human. And this is a little what I, um, I would like to hear uh, uh, today. Uh, I will just present myself really uh, briefly. I am uh, an architect from, um, uh, from, uh, uh, from Paris. I'm now, I'm currently in, uh, in Rome, okay. So, um, so just to, uh, to say, you know, what I'm doing in my work as an architect, I say that as an architect, you are, you are designing things, but in reality, the material is also designing things. So it means if you are doing a wall, like a vertical wall, it's not because as a human, you decide, okay, I do a vertical wall. It's because if you are doing a wall like that, you know, it will fall down. So it means that the verticality of the wall is made by the gravity and is also made by the human, but the gravity is also the designer of, uh, of the architecture. And then today, uh, the climate is also the designer of the architecture. It means that we, we are not, you know, like a, like a genius uh, designer, genius artist, you know, doing things alone, but we are, in reality, we are also made by, you know, by the virus, we are made by the, the natural uh, condition. So uh, just to explain that, uh, I will show just two things, two projects, you know, that are very simple um, about the condition. The first one is about uh, architecture. So it's to say, okay, as an architect, you are designing uh, with, before maybe during the postmodern period, we were designing with geometrical tools or with narrative tools or with, uh, uh, analogical tools, or I mean, with uh, uh, like like um, like narrative tools. But today, maybe we can also design with convection, conduction, with uh, natural phenomena. And to explain that, I just want to show uh, a small project made on convection. So this is an apartment, and it's based on um, some the idea how to reduce the consumption of energy linked to the physics of the, the air. You know, this is the Archimedes law, the warm air go up and the cold air go down. So it means that, you know, depending of our uh, action, if you are naked or 
if you have uh, some clothes or if you have moving a lot or if you have not moving, you know, you can find a real a good location in the layers of the air and the vert verticality of the air. So it means the bathroom will be where it's very hot because you are naked and full of water. So you need more heat on your skin. And in the bedroom, you know, you can be under the the, the um, inside your bed so you can uh, be, so we can use you know the Archimed the, the convective stratification of the air to design uh, the space uh, like that so this is a project we made we made a lot of projects based on that so here we can see that you know the the, the bathroom is on the top of uh, just under the floor and the kitchen is lower so this is more the climatic conditions that are creating the design of, uh, of the project. And as designer, we are working with the uh, with convection, with its meteorological climatic uh, real uh, parameter. Uh, another project we made on convection was also based on that. So this is just some image of uh, this. It was a, in the same idea, it's, it was a building for, uh, uh, for apartment and here you can see this is a section but I will show directly some image you know the slab are changing of high you know more you go up more it's becoming warm and more more you go down more it's um, it's uh, it's cool so we can see this uh, apartment you know you can have some migration inside the different uh, temperature of the air by moving up you know you go in the in the more warm area and you go down in the more cold area and uh, and then at the urban scale um, this is you know the condition of today you know linked to there is more heat waves there is more uh, um, uh, this is the urban heat island problem uh, there is more flood there is more pm 2.5 uh, particle pollution you know, and uh, all these things are becoming, you know, th what we are doing as a urban designer. You know, maybe before we are, we are talking about, okay, we will do a nice uh, visual axe on the statue of the king, you know, or say organization like more, more uh, prestige or some human organization. But today we have to talk about water management, rain management, uh, you know, solve uh, pollution management and things like that. And uh, just to finish uh, with that, this is a competition we have won with OMA, uh, with Rem Colas from uh, Netherlands, from Italy in Milan, where we are basing the new development of the urban, uh, some new district of, um, of Milan on all the um, um, uh, abandoned uh, uh, space. And we are creating some uh, environmental machine or like, uh, you know, the public space is becoming a new type of environmental machine to clean the air, to cool the air, you know, by using different type of, uh, of uh, uh, physical uh, property like the albedo, like the convection, like uh, different type of trees that can catch the PM 2.5 pollution. So all to cool the city by do by working with uh, with the physics and with uh, climatic issues. So, what I I, I, I am now finishing uh, with uh, with that to say, okay, today as designer, uh, we have to work, you know, with the element, with the natural element, and we have to say, okay, I'm not the only designer. The wind is also the designer. The heat is also the designer, and so. Um, you know, we, we maybe we have forget that during the 70 last years because we were using so much fossil energy, we were using so much antibiotic too. You know, we have completely lost this uh, presence of the reality of the physics of, um, of uh, the virus, you know, and this is what's happened today. So, um, so thank you. And now, uh, I think, you know, in the, uh, I will um, uh, maybe uh, have a small discussion of five minutes with uh, Tim Lecain. Uh, so uh, he's professor of, um, at Montana University. He's uh, the author of The Matter of History. Uh, this is, um, I think, a very interesting book. And uh, 
maybe I, I think this book can be very interesting in Europe and in France too, because we have a lot of, as I say, we have a lot of uh, books that are talking from a human point of view to the non-human, but we are not really talking from the non-human to the human. And I think, for example, Tim say that, you know, 80% of the cells that is composing it, that are composing the human body are non-human in reality. You know, we are, um, so it's, uh, and we know that some, uh, also some, you know, some uh, sentimental uh, things are also involving um, some non-human uh, uh, cell. So uh, maybe this is, um, this is, I think, uh, this is the, the question I want to ask you, uh, Tim, you know, maybe this is how you can, or in the history, you can reintroduce this uh, presence of the non-human, you know, as designer, as author, you know, in the in the in the reality of today. <clears throat> right. Um, well, thank you for that great presentation, too, Philippe. That was fascinating, um, and it does tie in nicely with the kind of material turn here and the neo-materialism that I that I write about, but. Um, yeah, I guess what sort of I'm very intrigued by what you're doing and what the other panelists I think are going to be talking about as well, and that that is this sort of possibility that the the world around us can be a creative force, it can be a dynamic force, and more of a co-creator with humans versus the old sort of idea even the enlightenment idea that, well, humans control the environment, they make things, they're the ones who are so creative and brilliant and special. And I think what's fascinating about where we are right now is this realization of our embeddedness in the world around us, right? That initially I think was sparked primarily by the realization of global warming. The idea that humans activity unbeknownst to them by and large would somehow have these huge effects on the environment, but then the environment is also affecting us. It's changing who we are and the way that we live and the way that we think. And once you sort of got to that level, it was more than just a backlash, wasn't it? It was more than just the earlier environmental realization that things we did were causing damage to our environment that we needed, but really that we're really embedded in that. And there's no escape from it, is there? There's no way to get out of global warming other than moving to Mars or something, right? Very impractical. It, it, it is who we are. And so I think that was kind of the key breakthrough, wasn't it? Then we started to realize this world is making us as much as we're making it. And what I find really exciting about what you were talking about, Philippe, is that you're trying to work with that creative environment. You're trying to channel it or to coax it or sort of nurture it. I think that more is nurturing than controlling we we grasp the possibilities and then they take us in unexpected directions it it has this kind of creativity as i said this sort of dynamism that changes who we are so when i look at your apartment and i love that idea of the different sort of convection levels i would also and you probably thought of this but i'd go a step farther and say how will that change the people who use that space? How will they think differently? How will they become different human beings? And that's, I think, the really hopeful moment that we're in right now is we're moving from the older belief that the way to change people's minds is to talk to them, is to convince them to think differently. I think the events last week here in the United States have to really make us question these old ideas that you know people are are primarily rational humans who who make decisions for logical reasons i'm i'm not sure that's that's necessarily 
the whole truth, but rather that they're being shaped by the environment. And that can be negative. It can be very bad, as we saw uh, on January 6th, January 6th. Or it can be very good if we design the right kind of places, if we have the right kind of architecture and the right kind of art. And that's, I think, where you're going, right? Th th these can be transformative. They can make us into better people, into better human beings who understand the world we live in. And so I'm really excited that you that you're doing this yeah. and that all the other folks at this forum are doing this as well. Tim, I have a, a last question uh, for you. You know, uh, it's quite interesting. If you look to the 19th century with Karl Marx, you know, the materiality was really there, you know, in the, to explain all the, 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 the thinking, all the, you know, the, the, we, as we, we think about the world, you know, the human way of thinking about things where determined by the materiality, you know, it's uh, the, the main idea of Karl Marx, but this disappeared in 1950, you know, we can see the first change with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, with the existentialist, that is creating a kind of spiritualizing, you know, moving from, okay, this is not no more the materiality that is changing things, but this is more the spirit, you know, and this is from coming from Heidegger and uh, and, um, and and Jean Paul Sartre, and then it's continued very strongly with uh, with uh, Adorno, Oppenheimer, and with uh, Michel Foucault, and you know, uh, and then today when we are talking about materiality, you know, the the strongness of the materiality, it's a really change from the postmodern period. So. Uh, you know, the, this is, what do you think about this change? Because it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the academy and the postmodern academy was so much based on spiritualism, you know, uh, without materiality, you know, like a very strange moment. So what, what oh, 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 you see this change? Because it's not so easy from an academic point of view. Yeah, that's a good way to lay it out. Yeah, that sort of historical trajectory from Marx to Foucault is really kind of fascinating. And I think my short answer to that, Philippe, is I do think you used the phrase, it was a, maybe that wasn't exactly your words, but a, a strange period, the sort of postmodern period, when this emphasis on ideas and discourse, and as you said, sort of a spiritual idea of who we are as creatures came to the fore. And I think as a historian, I ask, well, why did that happen at that particular period? And I think it was because of the unusual circumstance of the post-war period, where there was sort of illusion that technology was going to take over everything, that humans really could control the world and control themselves, right? That they could re-engineer themselves and re-engineer the environment pretty much with impunity and successfully. And that overweening sort of Promethean arrogance, I think, became the dominant idea and sort of filtered into the humanities as well. And people thought, well, it's what we think. It's what we, we can be whoever we want to be. And then the environment sort of reasserted itself, right? Materiality pushed back and we realized, one, that it's a powerful world out there. We can't necessarily control it. But two, and I think that's the more profound insight is to go back to Marx and realize that we are our environments, that we do emerge from the world that we interact with. I think he was right on about that, you know, Marx and Engels, that what you do and the things you interact with is who you become at, at a fundamental level. And now we have all this sort of science that confirms that, right? That shows us this really is true. As you say, you know, the three or you know, whatever, two or three kilograms of bacteria in my stomach have a big influence who, on who I am. And they're not me, right? It's not even my DNA. So to me, that's a really profound insight. So thank you, Tim. Um, so, Claire, uh, maybe we, you, you can introduce um, what you are doing. You know, you are using clay and uh, maybe as an artist, uh, Maybe you can introduce what you are doing and how you, you uh, what is your position linked to the ecology, maybe to the materiality. And uh, so maybe you can talk a little about, uh, about you. Hi, Philip. It's, uh, it's uh, Claire from London. And uh, 
I think that to respond to your question around my practice, I think that if I read my statement, then it might help to say a little about my position as well as the chosen use of my materials, I think, and the work that I've undertaken that deals with materiality and the sense of being human within materials and also the fragility of a lot of those conditions. But I think one of the largest issues that is daunting me as an artist is scale. And so the statement that I have is around scale being a massive issue with our understanding of the urgencies of the ecological crisis. And I think there is a numbness surrounding our personal ability to grasp and enact a response. And I think I feel that as an artist. Um, it is vital that for our ambitions for art to be a voice and an amplifier of action and change, that we address the numbness and the distance between the individual and the scale of the issues. I do think art can do this. I think it can pierce the film of resistance, not only that hinders, but that also protects us from the realities of our personal journeys that we will all have with our ecological crisis. And when I say R, this is kind of central to a lot of the work that I've undertaken. It's because I think the, the R is now because it's urgent that through our individuals can access a space of contemplation or realization of our futures. That is the future with action and a future without action. Art reaches deep into our personal spaces of self and the constructs we have set up to define ourselves. The connections art makes and touches in parts of our individual stories, and they can't be accessed in many other ways. In my work as an artist, I strive to create this moment for the public of the dawning of a story with personal impact that slowly becomes a story retold by them in their voice. As an artist, I have proposed and drawn personal commitment of many audiences to places of challenge. And now this must address our ecological crisis. It's time to reset. It is time to help others reset. So Philip, in answering your question of my practice, I think that I feel this challenge as an artist, but I think that the works that I've undertaken and the unstable environments that I've created with clay and other materials to address the destabilization and a commitment to either to hold, to care, to be a witness to that destabilization is really important. When you're stood in front of a pile of 10 meters high of broken china, there are questions to be asked of yourself, of the fairy tale of its arrival, and to, to the reality of it. As an artist, I feel very much that I'm not on these journeys by myself. I feel that the institutes I work with, you know, these artworks are, they're hard to build, they're difficult because they involve a lot of changeable factors on an hourly basis. So I kind of feel I'm not alone, but I think our tasks are really big, Philip. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Now I I will uh, introduce Alison uh, Tickle. You are here. We you are with us. Hello, and thanks uh, so much um, to everybody at Verbier and to my fellow fellow panelists. And I am very glad to be here and to be here with you because the climate and ecological crisis needs all of us to work quickly, to work collaboratively, and to keep focused and sure. There is no time to lose. Uh, the pandemic has shockingly accelerated the inevitable great reckoning with our deeply broken economic systems, which are in turn breaking 
our precious planetary systems and getting to grips with this emergency, understanding how to implement radical change is frankly impossible to do, maintaining business as usual. So rethinking is now an imperative. Um, Julie's Bicycle, which is a company I started uh, 13 years ago, um, was formed initially by the music industry, but now works right across the performing visual, uh, visual arts and museums. Um, we work with hundreds and have worked with thousands of organizations and artists internationally uh, to co-curate the ideas, the solutions, uh, the tools, the resources that we need to unleash the power of the creativity and arts to feel our way into the world that we need. And we do have the, the largest um, resource a uh, free resource for anybody who wants to take action, please do go and to the website www.juliesbicycle.com for, um, for some ideas. So um, Julie's Bicycle is founded on two ideas. One is that the climate crisis is in fact a cultural crisis. And two, that we cannot wait for the existing system, the status quo, to sort this out for us because it can't. It brought us here. We've got to change the system. And that means a step change in cultural in all cultural activities, in policy investment, in training, in tools, and in uh, commissioning and artistic ideas. We need a unifying and a mobilizing international approach that embeds sustainability and justice into the fabric of the arts. What might this look like? Well, we actually have all the key frameworks and ideas into which um, we need to pour the best of ourselves. We have the Paris Climate Agreement, we have Sustainable Development Goals, we have the Circular Economy, we have the Green Deal, and thank heavens, we have more and more commitment to restoring wildlife and nature. This is because we are profoundly and uh, um, wonderfully uh, part of nature, we are not separate to nature. Um, and we really need to think about restoring nature and restoring ourselves. There are four big themes here. One is an immediate, rapid and urgent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions to net zero. Two, a world without waste that moves away from excessive, um, often undesired consumption of finite resources pillaged from the natural world towards a more circular idea of, of uh, stuff. Three, we need to restore and protect our biodiversity and our wildlife. And four, we need to root everything we do, every thought we have in the idea of justice. This last is perhaps the most important because I have come to realize over the 13 years of being here that without justice, we are lost. This is justice both for ourselves as human beings, but also for the natural world that we share. The origins of the climate and the ecological crisis are in large part found in a prevailing attitude of human supremacy, often celebrated in culture and the arts over all other forms of life. This has fostered not only a terrible uh, uh, harm in, in the natural world, but also an un enduringly uneven global growth model, which has dispossessed millions of people of land and livelihoods and desperately degraded the natural world. So the story of climate change is not found in the ice caps. That's just a symptom. It lies in the buried histories of human conquest anchored in cultural values that celebrate the idea of human supremacy. That is why the climate crisis fundamentally is a cultural crisis. After years of being very centrally in this space, I believe that the most serious lost opportunity is the desperately slow realization of our deepest interconnectivity with Mother Earth and why we need to put art and culture at the forefront, forefront of our overarching response. But during the life of Trudy's Bicycle, I've seen and witnessed an incredible new ecology of creative climate practice that has been emerging all over the world. And many of you listening might see yourselves as part of this exciting movement of change. 
there, there are five key areas of activity that are currently operating um, and two new ways of working that cherish our planet. Collaboration is one of those. Work together, come together in this incredibly exciting movement of change, which is superseding competition. And the second is pathfinding, which is uh, exploring, discovering these new networks, these new mycorrhizal uh, ways of working that actually um, is creating different, different ways of understanding our journeys. We see this new ecology, which Mac maps directly across to, uh, to uh, the, the bigger frameworks in, first of all, our, the work, artwork, curation, exhibitions. This, the climate crisis and the cherishing of Mother Earth is the muse of the day. It is forming huge creative uh, inspiration and, and ideas. So there is no shortage of artists taking action, as many of you will, will already know. Secondly, people, campaigns, activists, people from the, the world of arts and culture who are getting up and speaking directly and didactically, didactically to their truths. We need to hear them and celebrate them and platform them. Three, organizations, leadership that's taking place in our institutions, organizations that are so often embodies the values that we, we feel uh, that are, that are, uh, are, are really rethinking everything that they do, every decision that they make and how they exist for their communities, collaborating together. Four, there are makers, social and material designers and innovators and architects who are really rethinking what they do and how they work in the world and what kinds of uh, social and material uh, practice that they've, they're developing. And five, there are influencers, the policy makers and the funders that are creating a framework and the investment in which we can create this new world. And here is the reality check. Yesterday, widespread news that 2020 was indeed the warmest year on record, regardless of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of around 7% um, as a result of COVID. We will not experience that, that reduction for many years to come. So we, we still have uh, a trajectory, a warming trajectory that is extremely serious. We're in the midst of this great reckoning, the eye of the storm, and there will be great turbulence, but everywhere renewal is bubbling up and gathering momentum. And in this movement, everything matters. All the small actions and connections, speaking to cultural values that cherish and care. The visual arts has a, has a magnificent history of activating social and more recently environmental transformation. But I have to say to you now, it is nowhere near enough. This year, in the run up to the next climate talks, which are taking place in November, which are the most important climate talks that we've ever had, they're called COP, the Conference of the Party, COP26 talks, we all have a once in a lifetime opportunity to transform this creative economy that is no longer fit for purpose into an ecology that is equitable, collaborative, resilient, and restorative. Thank you. Okay, maybe um, maybe I, I would like to um, to say something, you know, because we are designer, we are architect, we are artist, I think, and the Verdier Art Summit is about this connection, about uh, the art and thinker. And uh, I, I would like to, to say something about you know, a kind of um, division of two level or two, two layers. The first layer is the political layers about our uh, art. It means, you know, as an artist or an architect, you are taking the airplane to go somewhere. You know, it was like that before the pandemic, you know, you was taking the airplane and then you're doing an exhibition in, uh, so in another uh, continent, you know and you were using some expensive material and then it was destroyed ap after the end of the exhibition. So it was like the condition of, uh, of our practice. And then, uh, and then this is maybe, of course, there are a lot of things to do against that, you know, to reduce all the CO2 emission during all the process of doing something. But then, you know, uh, this is for all the citizens on the planet, they have to do the same, you know, so this is not something specific to the artist or to, 
to, um, uh, to architect or designer. Uh, then there is another layer, it's maybe the matter of the art. So the first one is the politic of the art, and then maybe the second one is the, the matter of the art. And I was, I was thinking about, you know, if I'm a choreographer, if I'm a dancer, what I have to do with my own art, you know, what, 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 oh, the climate change and the pandemic will change my art. And so I was thinking, okay, first, you know, I have to stop to think, you know, because we know that when we think loudly, you know, we, we spread the virus, you know, that's why, you know, in, it's, uh, it's happened, you know, in France, uh, the, the first moment it was in the church because everybody was, uh, what do you say, uh, singing, you know, and it was uh, creating a, a cloud of virus everywhere. And so it was a, the, 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 the first cluster of, uh, in France, in the east of France. So first we have to stop to think, you know, or we have to think about how to think without uh, spreading the virus. Or then if I'm a choreographer, oh, maybe I have to do a, a low calorie dance, you know, because if I'm moving a lot, you know, I need to eat a lot. And so maybe I have to change, you know, to do a very slow movement, you know, so I will use less calorie and so I will emit less uh, CO2, you know. So this is the real the change inside our practice, you know. We don't have to talk only about, okay, I will stop to take the airplane, I will stop to, you know, we have also to change our own practice, you know, and this is you know the the about the the distinction about form and uh, you know the content and the the, the form you know this is so this is quite in, important these two layers of acting so maybe if you all of you if you want to 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 have a statement about that or what do you think about that philip i i think i'd like to ask you a question about the statement that you just made to us because i think i'm quite intrigued because your description of a dancer is is super helpful it, it places us uh in a sphere that we think we know but i i i'm curious about your reduction of speed and of breath then i think i want to ask you the question of who then do we dance for who are we dancing for? This must be in your series of questions, not only what, what do we change of our dance, but now who do we dance for? Because there is more changes than just the ones we are in. It's a, it's a radical re-questioning of who do we dance for? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, the... the... I think this, you know, the, the climate, um, the global warming and the virus is also changing the form of, you know, it's no more the same form. It's not only, uh, it will create some new form. And, and then last year at the Verdier Summit uh, with, uh, with, um, um, with an actor, he was talking about, you know, uh, because there is a lot of uh, actors that are unemployed today, you know, so he was thinking, okay, because we can no more take the airplane, so maybe the actor can play the role of someone for a lecture, you know, so if, uh, for example, Tim have to do a lecture in Rome uh, tomorrow, so I will be, the, you know, I will talk like Tim, you know, uh, because I'm already in, in Rome, so I can play the real role, so it means that as an actor, maybe you can be the actor not only of fiction but on also of reality you know so this is a really interesting way of changing our way of thinking you know by by not talking only about the condition of our work you know of, about airplane and and material and co2 emission about that but also the change of uh, the our practice in in the in the for, in terms of uh, uh, form i think there's a there's a there's something underneath that which um I suppose it's it's perhaps it's implicit, but just pulling it out, which is, um, and it's very interesting by your question, Claire, uh, which is really what are we are we do we have a, a, a responsibility to serve something different? Is there a service uh, part of this? This old fashioned, but actually I think really interesting and meaningful word that has been anathema in lots of our arts practice for a long time. I mean, it's, it's a question that I think we all have to ask, um, whether we're artists or, or otherwise. But uh, that, that sort of principle of do no harm, it's the next step. It's actually, can we replenish? 
um, are we serving ourselves and our small communities? And it's a really big civic question at the moment, or is there something that is greater than ourselves? And again, I think Timothy, you brought that out beautifully when you were talking about this, this kind of uncovering of what it is to be a deeply interconnected part of, of, of our reality, to be formed by uh, and to be responsive to and fundamentally to be respectful and grateful for this uh, different existential uh, promise, recognition. Uh, and again, Claire, you were talking about the work that you do, how how to weave that in and of course at the heart of all of this is an is a brilliant moment for create for, for a start philip just to say i think it that it one of the things that i feel very strongly is that actually this is an embodied response it's not an either or we're so determined all the time to create binaries uh that you 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 do one thing or you do the other it it is it is art or it is practice it is um, the artist or it's the institution and actually I think now increasingly that there is a much more interesting dynamic flow that we all experience in our everyday we have multiple cells multiple bacteria you know we're so full of, uh, of, of bodies that are not actually ourselves so all of this wonderful which you've talked a bit about Timothy this incredible stretching of what it is to be to be uh, sensate but also I think uh, it it, there's just no fixed state in all of this and so when you talk about materials I think it's a question for artists as it is for every single being on this planet who can take make decisions to say is this a regenerative or is it a, 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 a depleting activity uh, and that's an incredibly exciting creative challenge I mean what a refreshing amazing renaissance for, for the arts and culture to unlock creativity in service to this greater, wonderful, living, breathing idea. Sorry, I'm going to shut up now. But Alison, I, I have to I have to pick up on that because it, it is uh, there are many practices that um, are regenerating materials and we can look at this as a conceptual form or we can look at it as a material form and i i do think that the separation of those is sometimes difficult you kind of like you, you talk about the polarization but there there are there are many ways that um you know especially in material cultures where one material form that has been an artwork is then reinvented into another form of another artwork and not necessarily with a bidding to the earlier, but a regenerated use of, of a thing in some form. And I think that for everybody who's listening to this debate, that doesn't just mean only the physical elements. It can certainly mean the conceptual elements and the wholeness of a thing. And I think that that sense of being in a history past, present and future is, is a co-relationship that all artists can understand. And as you say, it's a celebration of being understanding that to a deeper level, the, 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 the deeper level, Tim, that you've discussed of, of the, the, the knowingness of this. Yeah, maybe I'll add to it too. I think one of the fascinating lines of thought that's being developed here from Philip Ford is that, um, you know, that this process can be a joyful process. It can be a rewarding process. And one of the, I think one of the problems with the environmental movement that's beginning to shift a bit, but still is pretty endemic to the whole movement and to the way people see it and to ecological thinking is that, that it requires sacrifice, that we have to give things up, right? We're going to give up our big trucks. We're going to you know, give up flying, like you were saying, Thaley. you know, we have to deny things to ourselves. But I think one of the things I'm hearing here is, yes, perhaps, but there is a compensation. There is the joy that would come from that awareness, right? Even from as something as simple as how am I breathing? How much energy am I expending? And finding your connection to that world to these beautiful creative possibilities that you are all talking about, I think there's a real 
you know, it's not a denial of life. It's a celebration of a better life, of a richer life, a deeper life, and a more joyful life. And that's the story I, I, I try to put out there for those folks who see, you know, just doom and gloom for trying to respond to the crisis of global warming. Well, yeah, it's a challenge to be sure. There are big challenges we have to face, but um, I always tell my students whenever the weather's nice, you know, I ride my bike, I, you know, I ride my bicycle up to them. And, you know, we're outside, we often meet outside because I prefer to be outside. So I ride my bike up and I say, you know, riding this bicycle is not just about being ecologically sensitive or responsible, but it makes me happier. I'm a better person, right? And I'm a more creative and joyful person because I do this. So I think that's a message that I'm hearing too. It's, it, it really is a joyful thing. I think from the shared conversation we've had and from the words that we've all spoken, I think one of the things that I really want to pick up on is um, not only the work that I see Philip doing, but also the kind of celebration that Tim's made towards joyfulness, that there can be a path through this with art and activism from our points of reflection and doing and some of the things that surround us in terms of trust and recognizing human exceptionalism um, and that relationship to nature. I think the conversation we've had has really encouraged me that there is not only much to do, but this can be a joyous experience. Okay, thank you uh, everybody. And uh, so goodbye. And welcome to the live Q&A of the London Debate. My name is Annelixi Brandy and I'm the founder of the Verbier Art Summit. And I'm very pleased to have so many of our panelists here and hopefully one more coming in any minute now when he sees that he should be on the Zoom. Um, let's start with the first question. It's for Philippe. To come back to Jessica Morgan's comment about how an unfair, sorry, to come back to Jessica Morgan's comment about how environmentally unfriendly institutions were, have you noticed changes of behavior? Ab about what, say again? Yes. Excuse me. It, it is to come back to Jessica Morgan's uh, statement in her debate about how environmentally unfriendly institutions were and whether you have noticed a change. Yeah, uh, so, so uh, what I was saying before about, you know, the, the question of institution and the question of the art, I mean, the, the system around the art. So we have to, uh, it was unfriendly, you know, climatically unfriendly because it was using a lot of link to this uh, post -industri industrial society where airplane, you know, tourists, important to with all this uh, museum everywhere and to tourism to of economy post-industrial economy and, uh, and so this is uh, we have you know this is the the, the art the world of art have changed this uh, situation and uh, to reduce the co2 emit the carbon footprint of everything you know so there is something but to me, what is more important or more interesting eh, is to, what it is in our uh, practice, in our, how we think about our art and we are doing art uh, uh, or architecture. It means it was I was before, you know, if you think about, about OK Finger, so I have to invent a new type of music now. Be. And as I say, you know, I spread virus by singing. So you have a new type of music that will sing very <laughs> with a blowing virus, you know, how to sing with upcoming air, for example. <laughs> you know, it will, it will be a reverse type of singing where you, <clears throat> you have to, you know, not to, to spread virus, but yeah, so it, it, it have 
to change the, the practice. It was the same way of the dancer, okay, choreography, to not something where you have a lot of energy for moving them so strongly, but you have to do very slow, low calorie, you know, so that is so in and this Phil, is the line is a little bit bad, so it's, it's hard to hear you. Um, so I think I'm moving to the second question, which is from Daniele Simbida. Exploration of the life cycle, impact of the artistic work. How do artists look at internal, external? Process, performance, attendance, presentation. Claire, over to you, I think. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question because I think it's deeply personal. I think for every artist, this is deeply personal. And I think it's what I've seen in the conversations over the last couple of days that the more personal questions become our collective voice. And that seems really important in approach that we attend to the personal, but that becomes collective voice. So I think that to answer that question is to acknowledge that uh, art is not a corporation, it's a collective of individuals and how incredibly important it is to listen as we do and we become. And that's for institutions, it's for our own development, it's for the collectives that we want to be part of. Super, thank you for that, Claire. I have a question from Hannah Chapusat, who asks, Alison Tickell underscored the critical importance of the upcoming COP in November 2021. What are some concrete actions that artists can take to contribute to this global meeting? Um, so I think there's, a, there's an awful lot that, the, that artists can do um, in the run up to COP. The, it, this speaks very much to Claire's point about the personal being the collective and also the intimacy of how you take action. Um, artists, the obvious answer is that artists use their voice and that's really important because uh, speaking to politicians uh, who re require being elected, voted on, um, also expressing the collective concern, uh, reflecting the, the huge dynamic uh, landscape of moods, of responses to this uh, is really, really important to scientists to, for, to hear, for politicians to hear. So there's, there's the use of, of the artist's voice, and I mean creative voice, not just the sort of didactic um, so, uh, and, and that, uh, it, the, it is also about witnessing that, and that's a responsibility of the institutions and all those that cluster around the, the creative voice. But I also think that artists need to, just like everybody else, need to think about what this means to them and their practice. Um, and so uh, this is one of those areas where I think it's really important and very empowering and very energizing and a really creative thing to understand and start to unpick some of those questions about the impacts that we're having, the possibilities that we can bring to this, this hugely generous agenda. And that includes what we do. And one of the, you know, I think that the visual arts are an incredibly powerful community. We need to come together and work together, collaborate together, think about what this means, both in material and in creative possibility. Um, so artists need to be speaking to one another. They need to be speaking to their audiences and they also need to be speaking to the rest of the, the, the art world. Super, thank you for that. I have a question to all, um, but maybe for Tim. Do you think this idea of channeling nature is a method out of the ecological crisis? Mm. I guess I can take that on and sorry to join a little late. Um, that's an interesting term, channeling nature, but yes, would be my short answer to that question, absolutely. I think that what I learned from the presentations of the others and as I think about the art community and their role in dealing with these crises is how much they seem to have learned from what they do, from their engagement with nature. And by that, I mean nature in all its manifestations, right? What many people would consider to be 
human artifacts, but that still have powers and possibilities that come from their natural origins. And what do they learn from that? I think all of these artists that I've been learning about and seeing their beautiful work are channeling nature in a certain sense. They're finding that spark of creativity and possibility that was in the things themselves. And then taking it in new ways, they're interacting with it, they think in different ways. And as I've suggested before, I'd almost go so far as to say they become different people because they've done these things, you know, because they've made these beautiful works or these troubling works, these interrogating works, that they think differently. So yeah, I think that's channeling nature and that nature will guide us out of this. Nature offers us possibilities, new ways of thinking, new directions. We just kind of have to listen and that's what I think art can really do for us. Yeah, it's, it's definitely the common thread that we have seen throughout the, the 2021 summit. A question to all uh, by Georgina Turner. Do the panel see any advantage in our reduced mobility, which is likely to continue being? Yeah, I think so. Just to I sort of responded with in the, the text box there, so I'll just briefly say, I think it's an advantage to rethink our relationship to our, our homes, to the environments that we live in every day, and to, to pay attention to them more carefully and listen to them and channel them, as we were saying before, and find the opportunities. I mean, I love travel. I love going all around the world, and it's very enriching and it expands my thinking. I'm not saying that we shouldn't travel. There's so much to learn from that it's so rewarding but then on the other hand if you spend all your time thinking about other places you don't always pay attention to where you are and i think there's a lot we can learn from the world right where we are at this moment thank you i have a question for claire you mentioned scale as a major impact or issue in climate change can you say more on this i think that in in terms of the skills we have, it's recognizing the breadth of those. So um, not only, and I'll go forward and back between what we understand as the material skills and the human skills, but something that has become abundantly clear to me through talking with Philip and Tim is what skills are offered to us, the reforming of us by nature, the reforming of us by isolation, the reforming of us by the awareness of listening. So I think these, we need to think of skills as a very broad um, agenda that we recognize. And I think this is the moment we're, we're proving now that we can do this. We didn't know we had those abilities before, but in this rehearsal of the pandemic, we, we need to recognize those skills now. <laughs> Philippe? Yeah. I think we, we have also to be with this uh, with this no traveling world because you know the the, uh, the if you stay always in the same community you know you you cannot share ID you cannot uh, have new ID because uh, you know the uh, when new things arrive it's also because some someone is thinking about something in the other part of the world and then it creates a change in the world. So we have really careful to not to go in this kind of localism, you know, because it's, it will become very dangerous for people, you know, for if you, are, you know, if you, if you have done the local people and you can find a community somewhere else in another country or with some other people. So we have really careful also to this kind of fascination of localism that can be very dangerous for what will happen in the future. So I think the, to, to share, to exchange ID in the world is also the, the proof of saving ourselves from, uh, you know, some, some um, kind of um, damage that can go, yeah, we can understand that in the, in the history. Thank you. I think we're on to our final question for Alison Tickell. You began Julie's Bicycle working with music. Where did this initial connection between music and the ecological crisis come from? 
Uh, well, it was very much because I was work. I, I'm a musician originally, so I was working in music at the time. But I've also come from a family of climate activists, so it was really straightforward. I I also recognised, and I recognise in the visual arts community that there's a tremendous capacity to be creative to, and to really be entrepreneurial and really get things done. Um, and also to come together in a, in a really profound way, uh, express things in a really pr profound way. It's baffled me, as I think I might have said, that it's taken so long for us all to work out that, you know, creativity, art is actually at the heart of our, of our response to, to, this, to this issue. So it was pretty obvious. It felt very obvious to me at the time to just bring the two together. Super. Thank you all so much, Claire, Tim, Philippe, and Alison for your contributions to this debate. And thank you all for watching. We're almost at the end of our live series, but stay tuned.